would like to invite the Commission to begin this interactive dialogue. It is entitled, The Conversation with Great Minds. I'm pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists. We have Mr. Jacques Dubochy, the Emeritus Professor of Biophysics from the University of Lausanne. He is a Nobel Laureate in Chemistry from 2017. We have Sir Roger Penrose, who is Emeritus Professor of the Rouse Ball seat in Mathematics from the University of Oxford, and Emeritus Member of the Wadham College of the University of Oxford. I am also pleased to welcome our moderator for this interactive discussion, Madam Didi Akinyalur, a BBC and CNBC Europe television journalist. I now hand the lead uh, here, the helm, to our moderator. The floor is yours, madam. Thank you very much. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I guess I'll start by saying this. Thanks to the scientists of the past and present, breakthroughs in mathematics and physics allow us to enjoy the digital advancements of today. Scientific discoveries help us to understand ourselves better and accelerate human progress. Digital innovation is disrupting a range of sectors in the world today. Who would have thought that thanks to hydroponic systems and LED technology, a salad farm exists 100 feet below street level, beneath London's northern train line? What about palm-sized computers cheaper than a cup of coffee? autonomous vehicles in the mining industry, and the use of artificial snow to protect shrinking ice glaciers in the Swiss Alps. But in spite of all this creativity, the question that remains is, are we truly prepared for this innovation? And how do we use scientific research and frontier technologies to improve our lives while ensuring that no one is left behind? So for an hour this morning is an absolute um, pleasure to be able to tap into the great minds of Professor Sir Roger Penrose and Professor Jacques Dubochet. And I'll get straight to it because I believe the introductions have been done. Um, I'll start with you, Professor Penrose. You've made a significant impact in the world of mathematics, quantum mechanics, and physics. And there's an interesting saying that no one truly understands the quantum theory. For most of us, it's difficult to make that connection between the tech world and the real world. And yet, there is a view that the lack of understanding of science and tech in society stops digital advancements from moving at a faster pace. So how do we make science and technology more inclusive? Well, I think there are several issues here. <coughs> uh, of course... Microphone to the speaker, please. I'm so sorry. Oh, it needs switching on, is that right? I shall start again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think there are several different issues probably here. Um, one of these, of course, is the extraordinary complexity that comes about from science, which of course is very complicated, difficult to understand, and as you mentioned, quantum mechanics is something that, that uh, even the great uh, physicist Richard Feynman says nobody understands quantum mechanics. Um, and, of course, you don't like to rely on a subject that nobody understands. I think it's important that we realize the difficulty here. I think there are two difficulties with quantum mechanics. One of them is that the theory is difficult, and it's, it's non-intuitive. And there are things that you have to get used to. Some of these, like non-locality, ideas that particles can be in several places at the same time, and these things which are non-intuitive. Non non-intuitive. But on the other hand, they're completely consistent. What's difficult for people like me is that the theory as a whole is actually not consistent because we have certain rules which apply to small things and these rules don't seem to apply to large things. To me, this tells me that the theory is not quite correct. And so one of the difficulties is that the theory is not finished and that we need a better understanding of it. Now, there are two issues here. One of them is to explain to people so that they do have a better understanding of what the subject's about. But the other is, them, is to give them a feeling that this confidence of understanding the thing is not the whole story. I think this applies also very much 
to the digital technology which is taking over and it's got so complicated and it can do things way beyond the capabilities of human beings such as playing the game of Go or the game of chess. But nevertheless, one can demonstrate that these devices do not understand what they are doing and that even though they can technically do these things very well, there is a limitation in that they don't really know what they're doing. And the understanding of what's going on has to be the province of human beings. And I do want to emphasize that, that we have to be not overawed by the success of these technologies, because these technologies are a partial story. They're not the whole story. And we need human beings to understand these things, and we need human beings to explain these things to other human beings so they can understand these things, but not be, overall, oh, not be overawed by the successes. And I think this is an important message, that there are dangers involved. People often point out to the, danger, the dangers of, say, computers maybe taking over or something like this. Oh, this. This is not the danger that I see because... Um, sure, they do things which are extremely difficult. We, we even had old hand-held computing, you know, mechanical machines which could do complicated calculations that we couldn't do, but they didn't understand anything. And these technological things don't understand anything either. So we have to maintain our control over the devices. We have to um, show their limitations. We have to point out the dangers. And I think perhaps my role here is, I hope, to point out where there are dangers um, rather than uh, celebrate the successes. And I think the successes are great, uh, but nevertheless, we have to understand this in a broader context. All right, and Professor Dubouche, um, I know that you are passionate about creating a link between science and the society and uh, social issues, and in many ways it is the essence of your work. Uh, tell us why that is important in the work that you do. Sorry, there was an echo which was not accept, uh, adequate. Um, yes, um, my basic thought is that we are good in producing knowledge, we scientists. And indeed, we produce a lot of knowledge which are transformative for the world. Artificial intelligence is one of those. But do we use it for the best of mankind? This is, this is clearly not the case. We use it for what we can do. Each time we can do something, we do it. But we are, have not the mean to do it just for what is good for us. And of course, who should do that? United Nation, because Knowledge is the world, is a world affair. Only a world organization could deal with controlling that or helping that the world is and the knowledge is used for the best of all. Therefore, <laughs> hey, oh, there is a lot of noise here. <laughs> yes. Um, is it better now? Yes, thank you. And uh, therefore, I'll, well, perhaps I should go to another language, um, because there is here a lot of noise. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, when I got the Nobel Prize in, in Stockholm, I express the view that everything which deals with medicine should be 
under the control, under the property of the OMS, or World Health Organization. This is right for everything which has to deal with medicine. It should be the same with any kind of knowledge, computer, of course. And Mr. Penrose is rather optimist. They think that the, 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 the human are staying in control. Our hope is right, but what I see is that it doesn't look so much like that. Uh, that's my, what my first me All right. point of view. And you mentioned the United Nations, and I would like Professor Penrose to um, expand on that point, you know, the role that the United Nations plays, should play in raising awareness of research and technology, in your view, Professor Penrose. I think it's some problem, do we? Oh, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> no, I think it's absolutely fundamental that the United Nations, rather than any particular country, uh, should be uh, <clears throat> concerned with these issues. Um, I think people do sometimes worry that the United Nations, uh, maybe the organization, um, historically has come about through the division between the, the General Assembly, which um, everybody has a say, and the Security Council, which is a leftover from the Second World War. And I agree that there are issues that, about that, and maybe one should consider whether the overall structure might be altered in some way. And I have some ideas about that, but that I didn't think was part of the discussion here. I'd be a little worried about moving it in that direction. I certainly think that the United Nations is indeed the right place for this, and that... <coughs> We sure to, ought to address these important issues and not only the absolutely um, enormous value that scientific development has and how it will change the role that the developing countries have in the world and that they can have a, a bigger role in the world and also the role of women, which I think is also important. It's beginning to take place that women are having more influence on the way things operate and this is great. I have. Uh, <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and also there is this move towards um, clean energy and so on, which is taking place, and I think that's great too. I think in both areas we need a greater movement, but nevertheless these are areas uh, where I can see great positive action taking place. All right, and let's move on now to really the core question of the day, which is what is the impact of recent research and frontier technologies on sustainable development? Does technology hold the key? And I think I would like uh, Professor Dubache to take that. Yes. yes, technology is certainly the key, but it's not enough. Um, we have to learn where to go, and uh, there is two aspects here. We have, of course, um, and I mean now a moment, and this is, of course, the right place for that, uh, to concentrate about telecommunication. I would like to, or computer science. And uh, I would like to come later on the more general aspect of knowledge. But, uh, of course, with all this knowledge, we can help the world make progress. And the role of the United Nations or a place like this is to find out where are the, uh, support the way to, to, to get this knowledge to the, to, to the activity everywhere in the world. But there is another aspect. Knowledge will tell where not to go. For example, it's not, it's a, we have learned about climate change, about the, the, the problem of CO2, and, and then we have to convince the world not to go into the same direction, the same technological solution, like, so for example, private uh, uh, transport system, or 
imagine that Switzerland is, as I understand, the place where people are, most, are the most flying for recreative reason. Uh, this is a good way, uh, something that should be said all around the world. That's not a good way. It's not good that all the Indian, all the African, and all the, the Chinese learn to take their holiday through flying all over the world. We, going forward is good. Controlling where we go is good. Controlling where we do not go is also very good. All right, and Professor Penrose, let's hear your views on that as well, on you know the impact of science and tech on sustainable development. Well, I think the issue. Of sorry, <laughs> this issue of flying. I'm so sorry. I don't not understanding the technology here myself. <laughs> um, the question is. Uh, of course, there are various issues raised here about the... Uh, okay, let me raise an issue here. Overpopulation. This is something which is a taboo issue, I think, that people often mention, you know, can we sustain the world with the increasing technology uh, that we have to cope with a larger population? Well, indeed, we can, but is it a good thing to have this increasing population? It doesn't increase quite at the rate as it used to, but as far as I can see... Um, it's already too high. I mean, I can often complain there are too many people in the world. But of course, you know, in any individual case, if you try to restrict the number of people, um, that's not necessarily a good thing. The question that's raised here is the question of g going to Switzerland and I think flying here for the scenery, which I think is beautiful. But the problem, of course, is the airplanes. And of course, the problem there is that they use up all this uh, fuel which gives carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and is this a good thing or should we have a technology which enables us to sit in our comfortable chair at home and twiddle knobs and pretend that we are these different countries now these it, it is a complicated questions and i think that technology will move in the direction so that we can sit in our armchairs and um, artificially move around as though we were in some other country and then stop that country from becoming too clogged up with tourists this is a problem i notice in oxford of course because the city is of course very much clogged up with tourists and i'm glad that these people can come from all over the world and see the beautiful architecture and so forth in oxford but on the other hand there has to be a limit on this otherwise the place gets much too crowded and so i do i approve of the technology which allows people to go virtually yeah maybe but these complicated questions arise, and there are never going to be simple answers. Of course, this is the complexity I referred to before, that the world is very complex, and this means that we have to have these devices which uh, control, make sense of this thing. The Internet, of course, is very important here. It copes with the complexity of the world, but it introduces a complexity which we get it sort of under control, out of control. And and I guess the, so yes, and I guess the yeah, interesting point too is um, how do we measure you know the potential impact of these emerging technologies um, because we'll never know just how innovative or disruptive they can be. So how do we prepare for that? Is that it? Yes. <laughs> I think it's a, a, a very difficult question, and I don't know an answer. All I can say is that going back to what I said before, we have to think of it, let's, let's put it like this, we have to think of it more of a symbiotic relationship between us and the computers. We need the computational devices so that we can cope with this enormous amount of information around. So certainly that's true. But we also need to make sure that we are the ones in control. Now, I say this is not because I think, you know, well, we don't, we, we are people and therefore we don't want to be ruled by something else. The point is that the devices don't have any understanding. And I would like to use this word understanding as a crucial one. Human beings can have understanding, and this is because they are conscious beings. And conscious beings are not computers. And I think the feeling that that is very common amongst people is that because these computational devices can 
play chess better than any other human being, that can play Go better than other, any other human being. Therefore, they are cleverer than people, and therefore we should defer to those devices in making decisions. I think this is completely wrong, that they, are, they achieve their uh, uh, abilities from human understanding. And it is clear that this human understanding can be translated into these devices, which are understand, understood by a few people um, and made use of. All right. Now, um, I'd just like to get your thoughts on this. Uh, so whose responsibility then is it to um, uh, anticipate the impact of these emerging technologies on, on society? Um, is it the responsibility of the scientists in, them, um, in themselves, or is it the responsibility of the policymakers, or is it the responsibility of, of the UN? And I guess we can all work together. So how do we then collaborate? Professor Dubochet. Well, it's like democracy. There is not one solution for democracy. A country is not democratic because it's elect uh, with a vote a president. It's more than that. The same with uh, what to do with knowledge uh, is not a matter of uh, one person. Uh, if we would give all, we give all the power to the scientists because these are those who create knowledge, this would be a bad idea. However, they are those who are at the basis of what is developed, and therefore they have a special role, a special role of expert. But this is not the role of to be mixed with citizen. A, a, a scientist speaks as an expert. Beside of that, he should be a citizen and speak also as a citizen. And these are two things which are difficult to, to bring together. And in Lausanne, we have been very much involved in trying to convince that our scientists are also uh, 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 um, uh, uh, citizen. Therefore, we, we, I think that in every university, f the, the, the teaching, the formation of scientists should include a, a formation in ethic and in being as good citizen as they are good scientists. This is only one level. The level of the scientist, the 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 democratic dev development on what we do with our knowledge should go at every level of the democracy. And of course, at the top level, because CO2 belongs to the whole world, for example. And new t t technology uh, um, of uh, information, uh, information technology is something which concerns everywhere. I think that for the moment I, I follow uh, my uh, Monsieur Roger Penrose with the, the, the idea that uh, we are conscious being. I don't know if computer could be or will be conscious being. I just know that we have to control these developments. How we do that, I don't know. I am just a Nobel Prize who got this because uh, my work on cold water. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very important work, though, on, on cold water. Um, but I'd like to move on to talk about uh, developing countries. We're going to tap on uh, ethics as well. But it's one thing to see these creative innovations come through, but the digital revolution does not come cheap. And many developing countries are still at an early stage when it comes to tech advancements. Um, so, Professor Penrose, um, what should be done to ensure that developing countries are not left behind? Well, that's a difficult question. Uh, I wish I knew the answer. Um, I want to say I agree with Professor Dubachet and a lot of things he was saying about the role of uh, scientists and so forth. Uh, I think we scientists need, to, uh, when we feel we need to say something important, we should say so. And uh, I think since we have certain understandings, uh, we should make use of those. When it comes to developing countries, clearly, uh, we can improve, I mean, there are sometimes simple things which can improve 
such as, um, what is it, wind-up radios and things like that, which could be used. Now I gather that the, the uh, mobile phones have, had, have a huge influence on w the way people communicate, that when you don't have this infrastructure of, uh, uh, of telephone systems and so on, you can over, uh, do something which replaces that and is helpful for the developing countries. And clearly, uh, it is important to involve them and for them to have a say in what goes on. I'm not sure if I can comment yep. further than that at the All moment. Right. All right. And um, there's also the risk of um, technology taking the place of human beings and the human mind, which I know you, you, know, you have a lot of uh, thoughts on that, uh, Professor Penrose. Uh, but the impact on that, particularly in developing countries, could be significant. Um, so I guess how do we address this in general? Um, the, sorry, the question was, just remind me. Yeah, so yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a risk of technology yes, risk, taking, yes. Right. Yeah, sure, I mean, risks, well, one of the most important risks has, has been um, nuclear technology and nuclear bombs. And um, people say how it, you know, nuclear bombs has preve prevented a, a global war. But we're pretty lucky. Because if you go back, first of all, to the Cuba event, when, when Kennedy himself said it was only about um, uh, two to one or evens, that the thing would have had a favorable in outcome. And then we have the event in the submarine where uh, uh, there was a, a vote of two to one not to retaliate when depth charges were uh, seemed to be the start of the World War, and then there was a further case when, when uh, it looked as though there were, uh, the Russians were being attacked because of some cloud formations that looked like, a, <laughs> looked like an attack, and it was only the good sense of somebody who didn't obey orders who stopped that. Now, any one of these individual cases, you might say, well, maybe the balance was slightly in favor of the right thing, but if you take all three together and work out the probabilities, we are very, very lucky that we did not end up in a global war. Now, it seems to me that's an extreme case, but on the other hand, there are events which, sure, can misfire in one way or another. As an example, you can also have uh, people taking advantage of technology, like the, uh, say, kidney transplants or something, and then, and then um, people go to... Um, third world countries and, and persuade people to give up their kidneys for, for a fee. And this is a dreadful consequence of, of this technology. So there are all often side issues which are very hard to predict. And I think we have to do our, the best we can. That's all I can say. All right. And um, I wonder your thoughts on this, uh, Professor Dubochet, as well. Um, in this a new age of artificial intelligence, uh, where um, um, there's some view that, you know, we have perhaps lost some of the deep thinkers of the past. Uh, do you think that in some ways some of the um, thinking is being done for us, Professor Dubochet? I don't know. Um, well... I go back to the issue of just before uh, we were speaking about artificial intelligence, about nuclear weapons. Um, my field is closer to the new development is in genetics, and I think this is a typical case where progress is remarkable. It's coming, the knowledge is improving very rapidly, but we are not prepared to control it so that it is used for the best. It will be used for very great things, that's clear. But it could also be used for very nasty things, and how do we make sure that this doesn't happen? At the beginning, the scientists are responsible. That's, they must feel this responsibility. It's not enough just to produce knowledge. But a scientist, we know, there is a, a, a word which is an interesting uh, development which are um, improving function by viruses. And the idea is to make virus more deadly to be sure that we are prepared when it will come, for example. And uh, of course, the scientist in his laboratory who is who know the virus, who, who know the problem, is the best one to develop this technique. But 
he is clearly in, he has a sufficient view of what are the risks, what are the possibilities. And therefore, I think for a lot of this new technology, we are not, it's not possible to leave the scientists just alone. I know the enormous trouble, problem that this represents, to put a control on research. But we have a control on research. When we publish a paper, we address the paper to the peer for review. And only when the paper is correct, we, uh, can, it is accepted for publication. The same uh, kind of uh, uh, review for risk should be introduced in all these regions of science where the, the possibility uh, is open. The possibility of a danger is open. This is the problem of the, the, the principle of precaution. The principle of pre precaution should be applied in science. All right, and I would like uh, Professor Penrose to uh, continue with that view, you know, the, the view that even though scientists are responsible, but uh, they must also work with policymakers and the United Nations so that we can mitigate the risk that could um, come. Well, I very much agree with what Professor Dubouchet was saying, and it's very difficult. Perhaps there's a case for... On the whole, now I don't quite know what, how to say this, on the whole, um, younger people tend to be less concerned about, you know, they're concerned with their own progress and ideas that may come when they are young. And only later on, when they have the knowledge, perhaps, uh, then they can um, see how this knowledge relates to, to global issues. And it's important uh, that they should do so. I think that, that is true. Um, could I just mention one thing here? which is I was asked recently to write a blurb for a, a new book which is going to be published by the Princeton University Press. This is a book by Martin Rees, the, the uh, astronomer royal, Lord Rees, and he brings up an, also an, an enormous um, number of issues which have to do with the future and how technology developments may influence our future. And I think it's a very important book. I don't always agree with everything he says, but I think that the issues that he brings up, and it's very, very uh, overreaching in the uh, discussions. And I hope people will look at this book, which is not yet out. I can't even remember the title, except, except that it's something like uh, uh, The Future or something like that. So these are addressing issues which could have important relevance to human uh, development com f coming from technologies, coming from science. And I think maybe this book and books like it should be encouraged because they, they may not always get it right, but on the other hand, they bring up these issues and it is very important that they should be studied. All right, would like to actually take some questions because this is uh, an interactive session. I would like to open the floor for questions and comments um, and kindly limit your remarks to one minute. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, perhaps you could just raise your placards, which are right in front of you, and um, we shall go on from there. Anyone? Okay. The, is the Minister of Sri Lanka, he would like to make a comment. Thank you for those very uh, interesting presentations. I'd like to remind you that this is the 50th anniversary of Space Odyssey, where the computer takes over. But the question, however, is that many of the developing countries have a uh, traditional culture which is sometimes anti-scientific or neutral. And as uh, the first Prime Minister of India mentioned, one of the uh, major interventions he made was to try and change this uh, traditional culture to one that is more proactive and more favorable to science. So that seems to be the uh, major problem in developing countries. He also 
mentioned, particularly the leapfrogging from very primitive uh, levels to very acceptable levels of intervention. As you rightly mentioned, there are large populations with large problems, and you need to find shortcuts to alleviate suffering, to ensure progress. And I think there is a big role for science, and uh, you have emphasized the role of the scientist, but it has to be matched with the conscience and the competence of policymakers as well. So it is not a matter only of scientists, but also a bigger community of decision makers who have to uh, be sensitized to the issues that particularly scientists may know to a great degree, but not the others, the policy makers and the other uh, intellectuals and other elements in that society who should uh, have their voice heard. Thank you. Would you, would you like to respond to that at all, uh, Professor Duboche or Professor Penrose? I, I can't just agree. Just all right. I can't just agree. Y yes. C can I make a comment? Um, yes, I, I, I was uh, glad to hear the mention of, of Arthur Clarke and uh, <laughs> the, the uh, film 2001, which I, uh, it made a big impact on me, and I thought that was very important. I, one thing, of course, I don't agree with was that the computer would actually have a consciousness, but that's a particular view which I have here. Um, but it did address issues which are very important. And... Uh, I think one thing that comes out here is that it is important that science should be explained to the general public, but in ways that are not too superficial. I think one of the troubles is, and I certainly notice this with uh, announcements of new scientific developments, which one often hears on the radio, for instance. I hear on the BBC and some new developments. I thought, haven't I heard that one before? Because these are things which are easy for people to appreciate, and there may be things which immediately affect uh, an ordinary person's understanding. But it doesn't give one an overall picture of what's going on. And I think one needs to have uh, maybe a, a more concerted effort of not just explaining science to the general public, but explaining science at a deeper level so that one can get an idea a little bit more of the technicalities, the problems, uh, the issues that arise, and I certainly tried to do this myself with maybe limited success, but uh, I hope that other people can follow up on that and explain scientific ideas in a way which is not just easy for people to understand, but which goes more deeply into what's really going on in the science and how the science could affect uh, social issues, how it affects how people live and how people think. All right, I shall now give the floor to the Minister of Science and Tech uh, from South Africa, after which we'll hear from the um, Minister of Higher Education, Zambia, and followed by um, distinguished representatives uh, of Mexico. So over to the Minister of Science and Tech, South Africa. Thank you very much. I think I'll, I'll just come through um, from what, where Prof Penrose has just left. We definitely have, because the point here is, if we are to make sure that South Af um, citizens across the globe understand what is being done, it's not only about the language, but it also makes sure, we need to make sure that we create science conscious society. Because in that way, then you have a buy-in. Because at times, as you're saying, Prof, you find people who are going to talk about something, and society can, citizens can relate to it. Um, and then it becomes a challenge. How do you ensure that even the younger generation, I think the point earlier on of young people who are doing work in the science field, but cannot link it to finding solutions to our society. I think it also goes to that creating a science conscious, but linking it to even decision making. Because if we bring these young people as part of decision making process, therefore when they are innovative, they should be able to do their work in innovation, link it to assisting countries to be able to find solutions. So I thought that point for me is very important and therefore we need to emphasize 
national science and innovation has to be linked to solving the problem. But in order for us to do that and for people to understand, for citizens to understand that we're doing this to betterment of our society, it has to be starting with creating a science conscious society. Thank you very much. All right, and let's now hear from the uh, Minister of Higher Education, Zambia. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I was very intrigued and wanting to hear the sort of uh, discourse would be, in particular when you ask questions around developing countries. And uh, a lot of our countries are at a stage where maybe the highest percentage in the country are illiterates. And if it is difficult to discuss science for those of us who are very well grounded in terms of our educational levels, you can imagine the challenge that has for the greater societies in our countries. Uh, just let me pick an example. For example, a country that wants to start implementing a nuclear science program. And probably the majority of people just associate nuclear science with what has happened where things have gone wrong, like what happened in Russia, what happened in Japan. So how do you even start a discourse in a country where the people, the negative impact that nuclear has had in its early stages is what the only thing that people remember? But then we are saying, due to globalization and technology, we shouldn't leave anybody behind. We all must start moving together. So it actually poses a very, very big challenge in the developing countries at the moment, especially that uh, our people are very illiterate. So how do we catch up within an illiterate society that knows very little about science, where in the meantime the technologies are flourishing and the countries that are developing those technologies are way ahead of everybody else. And yet we keep saying we shall not leave anybody behind. We need to find a formula that accelerates all this. And therefore, for me, I see this not a problem of scientists only, but a problem of everybody, especially the developed countries versus the developing countries. So I'd like to hear a little bit from the two renowned professors how we can actually short circuit. Thank you. All right, so there are a lot of questions around you know, creating science uh, conscious uh, societies and also raising awareness in developing uh, countries. But before we answer those questions, I'd like to give the floor to the Vice Minister for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights uh, from Mexico. Thank you. Uh, artificial intelligence, along with other new technologies, such as nanotechnologies or, uh, or biomedical technologies, I, I think they represent both a promise and a big challenge for uh, SDGs implementations. But at the same time, I, you know, this so-called fourth industrial revolution will have tremendous economic, social, political impacts. It may dislocate labor markets. It may have important uh, uh, ethical uh, questions. Uh, uh, when you uh, develop these technologies without any governance, the, the fact is that today there is no international governance on this. You both underline that the UN should play a major role in providing governance. And recently, uh, the United Kingdom Parliament adopted a new national, national legislation precisely to provide governance to ensure that uh, these technologies, especially artificial intelligence, is developed only for the benefit of society. My question to you is very simple. Do you think that the United Nations should start considering uh, governance frameworks? I don't know exactly what kind of frameworks, but governance frameworks, an outline that may guide 
the international community as a whole on providing this, this governance for the future. Thank you. All right, thanks for that. And now I'm giving the floor to the Minister of Higher Education, Science, Technology and Innovation of Angola. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dibouché, I kept the, um, your sentence uh, that uh, voting on, on elections is not enough to assure democracy, which I totally agree. So I was wondering if uh, you can make some comments concerning the challenges that emerge when, link, when we link technology, democracy, and uh, society in this contemporary global society uh, with different cultures, as we uh, have uh, heard before, and very different stages of development in technology and uh, even in democracy implementation. Thank you very much. All right, and now let's hear from the distinguished representative uh, from Nepal. Thank you, Madam Moderator, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, as a student of science, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to talk with the distinguished professors, Professor Pinroz, Professor Pinossi, this morning. It was a thorough delight to listen to you, and uh, I will keep my questions a uh, little bit technical, not so much political, because when we talk about the invention, it becomes uh, technical. When we talk about use of technology, it gets a little bit wider sense, and it, it takes a political form. Uh, Professor P Pinossi uh, talked about the peer review of the scientific innovation or the technology, somewhat similar to the invention of uh, uh, a technology or a publication of the paper. So in one side, we see the most sophisticated technology being generated, like his one invention. And he's thoroughly right that these kind of innovation should be, of course, reviewed so that, as he pointed out, they will take the right path and the path to the wider benefit. And on the other hand, we see that the people, students in the remote villages, schools, colleges, in the laboratories, they are trying to learn what has already been learned. And there is a huge gap a gap that we really feel that the science is aid to take the wider stage. Robotics, genetic engineering, or some modern day innovations are far beyond the, even the reach of the learning scientist in the countries of the developing world. So can Professor Duo suggest some better ways to popularize science, to give people, to students, the young learners, the access to, to be a part of innovation. All right, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, I shall give the floor to a uh, representative of the ETC group. We, of course, would like to get the uh, responses come through from the professors, and we have about 10 minutes left, so would like uh, to take that uh, final uh, comment or question from the representative of ETC group. Over to you. Moderator, for the opportunity to ask this question. I'd like to say that I'm quite honored to have this opportunity to, uh, to engage with Professor Penrose and Professor Duboucher. I have three specific questions. Uh, one to Professor 
uh, Penrose, like our organization has been pushing for participatory technology assessment um, right from the ground to be able to engage citizens and different players, different actors in evaluating technologies before they are deployed, even during the stage of design. It's not a cha it's not an easy proposition given the the frame that we have now that technology and science is a domain of of the experts. And I think your whole intervention is about engaging citizens, which we which is very encouraging to, to know. I'd like to get your opinion. I'm also building and linking this to the intervention of the ambassador of the of the minister from, from Mexico. Uh, what do you think about the idea of setting up uh, a technology assessment mechanism in the UN um, to be able to look at the horizon in terms of the potential impacts of these new technologies, AI, synthetic biology, nanotechnology, and their poten potential impacts on society? Do you think um, this would be uh, feasible and this would be um, acceptable, um, like coming from the scientist uh, perspective. Um, to Professor Dubouchet, I, I have a question because you mentioned that the precautionary principle has to be applied um, on this, um, on, on looking at this um, developments, particularly in AI. I, I would propose a quite controversial um, assertion, uh, which we have been um, espousing as well in some parts of the UN, the idea of applying the precautionary principle by imposing moratorium on particular um, technologies like synthetic biology because you mentioned that there are ways for, for, for peer review. But then, as you know, the developments in synthetic biology now enable um, engineers to be able to, to develop um, new products that are not even regulated in garage, in kitchens. So there's no peer review there. So do you think that, uh, synthetic, uh, that, that's, that a moratorium would be uh, appropriate in those um, circumstances? And third, for, for both, I'd like like to, to get your views on um, recognition of, of diverse sources of knowledge and how they can be integrated in the development of, of harnessing of science and technology for development. When I say diverse sources okay. of knowledge, like recognizing and giving um, rec recognition and also a place for the role of local knowledge and traditional knowledge systems um, to be able to contribute to in achieving sustainable development in general. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Let's uh, quickly hear from the uh, professors. Um, I'm going to put these questions in, 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 one, in one bulk, in one frame, really. I guess we could start with um, answering the questions. A lot of questions around um, awareness and education and creating science-conscious societies. Some of these we have touched on, but, you know, popularizing science. Um, so very quickly from uh, Professor Dubochet, perhaps you could uh, answer those questions when it comes to, you know, um, education, um, science-conscious uh, societies, and making science more inclusive. Yes. yes, thank you. Of course, I must repeat, I'm not educated to answer these questions. And from this point of view, I can nevertheless say a few things. The first one is, um, well, developing world. I feel very close to this question and to these problems, and I <laughs> will try a <laughs> surprising remark. Um, when I started school in the year before, I was in a small village in a uh, mountain in Vallis. And this was, according to the modern, to the, to the modern view, a, 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 a place in, in development. And it has changed enormously. Now it is developed. Yeah. One should give time and chance for developing, and uh, especially uh, give chance to the women to become uh, <laughs> developed. Um, that's, that's one. Um, that, and of course, this can be done at the broad level only if there is a decent go governance. Therefore, the word has been this world is, the word has been mentioned several times in this different point of view. Governance, governance. If we have a good governance, we can develop. And the problem of this country, where a majority of the population can't read, I think that in my village this was the case when I was young. It has changed now completely. 
uh, I would like to say a word about moratorium. Yes, we should introduce moratorium on a lot of different things which are out of control. But moratorium should not mean stop. It should mean explore, explore at every level, explore at the scientific level. Is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? Explore at the political level, explore at the you know level. What, how can we have a governance on that? And we are facing with an extraordinary challenge. And okay. so this is a good place to think about. All right, perfect. Now I would like to you know, hear from uh, Professor Penrose as well. There's of course, some questions around um, you know, evaluating uh, tech before they are deployed, um, uh, you know, doing assessments in-house in the UN, uh, and also uh, if the UN should consider a governance framework you know, to guide um, you know, um, uh, communities and the international community. So perhaps you could take that very, very quickly, Professor Penrose. Thank you. I think it, <clears throat> yes, I think the UN should take this up. Um, I'm no expert on issues of governance, but it's clearly very important. Perhaps I could wa address one question about um, countries which, where there's a lot of illiterate uh, people and don't read, I suppose. Uh, now, one way you can get information across rather than in books is in uh, educational television programs and so on, and things like uh, what well, David Attenborough's programs on on the natural world. Are, are, of course, this is in the English language, and perhaps in these countries the English language is not spoken too, so there could, of course, be translations where necessary. But it seems to me that, that it doesn't have to be... Literacy does not have to mean necessarily the written word, it could involve, since with technology we now have the ability to have wonderful programs where, where you can confer, uh, transfer information in a visual way, um, I think it's extremely important. Uh, it's easier, I think, in biology and so on, where one can just look at animals and things where if you have things like uh, physics, which involves a lot of difficult mathematics, that's not so easy. And so I can see the problem there. Nevertheless, I believe it, it is probably true that one could convey information in a way other than in books um, or even what, audio books and things like that, uh, where, where sort of visual um, technology can be used to convey information. But I think this issue of governance is very important. And I think to be able to distinguish between good science and science which is not good science. Well, peer review is important there, but it's not perfect. Um, one has the issue of a moratorium. I'm not sure what to say about that because a mod it's so easy to violate these things, I imagine. But maybe that is a, g a good idea or something I think what in the lines along which Professor Dubache was mentioning sounds like a, a very um, sensible way of proceeding. Perhaps I can stop at that point. All right, and I think uh, that's a good place uh, to leave it. Uh, thank you very much, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's been an absolute honor to tap into the great minds of Professor Sir Roger Penrose and Professor Jacques Duvoche. Thank you. Excellencias, distinguidos de... Excellencies, distinguished delegates. I'd like to thank the distinguished